encourage you any. I think it's cooler up here than it is downstairs. Does that help <laughs> anyone? Tonight we have a rather tricky subject, so I suppose we might as well dive into it and hope that the uh, warmth of the evening will not cause too much psychic fatigue at this time. We are working this evening to determine, if possible, the processes of the subconscious mind in relation to man and, as I termed it, nature, or by which we mean those forms of life in which uh, intelligence is possible, but which are not human, according to our understanding. In the last 25 years, we have tried to be very objective on the uh, subject of the human mental activity. And the most concise statement to summarize the general conclusion is that mental activity is now regarded as a form of motion. That it is tied with the concept of movement. And that therefore, thinking is a kind of qualitative motion not from a place to a place, although thought may direct bodily motion from a place to a place. But in itself, thought is a motion from a condition to a condition, from a previous state to a present exertion uh, toward a subsequent condition. If, therefore, we regard the possibility of thought process being a process of motion, how does it differ from every other motion that we know in nature? Well, we observe that that kind of motion, which we term intelligence or intellectual motion, seems to be eccentric in one particular. Instinct can cause things to infinitely repeat themselves. But when, in the process of motion, from a previous toward a subsequent state, uh, the moving object or the moving being is subjected to a crisis, to an unexpected or an unusual condition, then we begin to see traces of true mentation. Thus, we have come to assume that the mental processes are most easily distinguished uh, when habitual procedures become inadequate and the individual is suddenly confronted by something new, by a problem not previously solved, or one certainly unexpected in the situation in which it arises. We immediately observe that under such conditions, the individual is capable of a kind of activity by which he increases the total intellectual substance of himself. He is able to do that which previously he could not do, or shall we say, previously he had not done, and about the doing of which he was previously unaware. Thus emergency, or the challenge of the new and the unusual, these most clearly reflect and reveal the existence in man of a creating, solving, intellectual power or faculty. The question then naturally arises, is such faculty, evident or present elsewhere in nature. If mentation is associated with motion, if it is in some way a flowing and motion itself is purposed, and we must assume that motion is purposed, movement has to have reason. It has to fulfill a, re a requirement, 
meet a need, express a desire. Things do not move simply for the sake of moving. They are moved for purposes or for reasons. And uh, the Greeks began to study the substance of motion uh, to distinguish between the types of movement that could be noticed as things self-moved or things uh, not self-moved or things apparently motionless in the midst of motion. About the latter group, the Greeks themselves had serious misgivings. They doubted if anything was actually immovable, unless it might be deity itself, which could be immovable because inhabiting all dimensions, there was no direction in which it could move, being total life in itself. But if motion is in some way a proof of the presence of intellectual energy, then may we not uh, advance the, the possibility that all motion, uh, whether it be in animate things or inanimate things, reveals a certain amount of intelligence. Uh, the French Academy in the last century sought to discover the nature and substance of intelligent energy. And they finally came to the conclusion that energy did show certain rudimentary forms of intelligence. If we wish to assume that the materialist has a strong case, and that we can no longer depend upon spiritual overtones to explain man, then man's intellectual light must arise in his energy fields. Intellect must be in some way a production of energy or a production of motion. Now we observe that in motion all things moving are governed by laws of their kind. The flight of the bird is not merely an accident or an incident. The flight of the bird is the result of the coordination of innumerable factors. The bird is constructed in a way in which its flight is possible. It instinctively and inevitably uh, becomes consciously aware of its own flight possibility. And whether it has any thought about the subject, we do not know. But at least it instinctively flies. And that there has to be a certain education involving mind potential would seem likely from the fact that the parent birds have to teach the young bird to fly, and that the bird resists this education to a degree, and must gradually be indoctrinated uh, with the rudiments of the kind of life to which it belongs before it assumes the full responsibility for flying, which is its natural right. Also, we find that all types of creatures, we can say, possess instinct. But this instinct, in most instances, is more than the mere repetitive process of doing what has always been done. Most animals can react to emergency. Most animals show, if only to a rudimentary degree, uh, the possibility of personal solution to problem. Perhaps they have to be heavily indoctrinated before this is possible. Certainly they do not as immediately rationalize as man does. But experiments with various types of animals, even reptiles and fowl, have indicated that these creatures can be taught and they can be taught largely by the most common uh, inducement that nature has, and that is the inducement for food. Thus, most creatures will learn to solve the riddle of how to supply themselves with the food necessary to live. And under the tremendous stimulus of need, uh, they will develop ingenious capacities and abilities uh, to gain this food. 
experiments in comparative psychology have shown that uh, birds, animals, reptiles, rodents are very easily taught certain procedures. Now the psychologist points out that while the animal or reptile or bird can be taught, it then establishes a kind of habit pattern and will usually abide by that pattern, lacking originality or lacking the ability to work through the type of equation which distinguishes the human mind. There is, however, evidence to sustain the belief that in the animal kingdom there are advanced types and that these types can gradually be trained or can be unfolded by various inducements until they reveal many of the mental aptitudes, abilities, and thought powers uh, associated with the normal life of man and uh, can be given an intellectual existence equivalent to a six to eight year old human child. Therefore, we cannot say that the intellectual faculty is entirely absent. Now, when we start working with less animate things, uh, let us take almost any kind of structure you wish to consider. Uh, for example, plant life, which is still, however, more or less animate. But let's go back to minerals and the um, cleavage of crystals. Uh, in this procedure, there is a definite indication of law and order. We would be very unhappy indeed if any of the reasonable patterns of consistency upon which we have learned to depend should suddenly be reversed. The falling object reaching the ground, uh, the experiments of Galileo with the pendulum, uh, the various motions of the heavenly bodies, the inclination of the Earth's axis, all of these kinds of things play a very large part in our lives, whether we know it or not. And we would be greatly dismayed if any of these procedures suddenly became eccentric or departed from their reasonable probabilities. We could be in serious trouble almost immediately if water did not consistently run downhill. But this situation however, has to do with motion. Now what is it that prevents many of these motions from becoming eccentric? Presumably, the interaction of various factors. Uh, these factors working together seem to bind uh, a particular form of life into a structure from which it cannot escape. Actually, however, we have no way of being certain that nearly every so-called lawful process in nature, any consistent methodology with which we are acquainted, any procedure that goes on through the ages, uh, filling us with confidence that it will indefinitely continue, any such procedure may very well imply a motion with intelligence. We do not know that it does not. We assume that it does not. And we are against another subject of difficulty, even to the psychologist, although he is beginning to sense its implications. The only thing we can seek for in estimating the intelligence of other forms of life is the kind of intelligence which we ourselves possess. It is conceivable that there are other entirely different types of intelligence. That the tests of our intelligence may not exhaust that which can be considered the true expression of intellect. That what we have is a highly conditioned form of intelligence we know. And as we study it more and more, we realize something else, namely that gradually what we call intelligence has been conditioned, perhaps from an original pattern of instinct. Today, 
the intelligence of the average human being is not strictly his own. His intelligence is derived from a variety of factors and circumstances moving in upon him. For example, his intelligence might be seriously injured if his memory failed him. And yet memory and intelligence cannot be regarded as identical. What we call intelligence is often merely the folk way of solving a situation or problem. Less and less are we actually required to express individual intelligence. Thus we live in a comparative security resulting from common processes which we share together and about which we uh, have a broad acceptance without understanding. Deprive man of all of these additional outside modifying conditions and block out of him the memory of them, leaving him only with a primordial group of faculties with which to work. And it is quite certain that his reflexes might not be at all what we, uh, what we assume they will be today. Thus, uh, intelligence to us is schooled, trained, and educated. It is influenced by propaganda, advertising, promotion. Uh, our minds are subtly, constantly impregnated uh, with ideas that are not really our own and about which perhaps we have very slight true knowledge. Uh, we see this more and more with the gradual disappearance of individuality. Uh, the great struggle of the person today is to retain his own individual position in mental existence. And he is having ever greater difficulty doing this. He is finding heavy penalizations on such procedure. The easy, the inexpensive, the efficient way to live today is in complete conformity uh, with broad patterns of acceptance. This conformity is not true thinking. It is not really very different from instinct. Instinct perhaps arises in the blood of things. Conformity in the experience of things. Instinct may be a pressure from within us, but conformity is a pressure from around us. And it is difficult to say uh, whether instinct or this <coughs> pressure constitutes the more lawful uh, cause or dynamic behind activity. We must, generally speaking, accept the fact that the average person thinks only in emergency and gradually protects himself more and more against such emergencies as may cause thinking. Thus, in uh, matters of originality, uh, we have always a poverty in times where intellectual energy is not individually developed. We are style conscious. We are habit conscious. We allow other people to make up our minds in almost every detail for us. Perhaps this is a kind of collective thinking, but if so, what does it actually amount to? Is it essentially different from the collective type of thinking which perhaps made certain social existence possible to the savage and also as instinct perhaps still dominates a large part of the animal and plant worlds? We know that plants have a certain ability to discriminate. Uh, to sense value and that, among other things, they will struggle desperately uh, to reach light, to reach nutrition, or to survive by adjustment to very difficult situations. Thus, survival, in one way or another, seems to drive all things on. And the primary motion in nature is the motion towards survival, towards continuance. It's a will to live. 
Now, can a creature totally without mentation have the instinct to survive? This has been a very moot question. Whether, for instance, the little vine uh, that struggles out of the dark cave and finally manages to throw one feeble branch into the light where it can secure a necessary form of life, does this little plant know that it is striving to live? Perhaps it does not know. If it does not know, is this important? Does the fact he does, that it does not know its own motive detract from the intellectual validity of the action? If so, where does this leave man? How many human beings know what they think with? How many human beings can actually give an, an absolute definition of mind? None up to the present time. Uh, how does any individual explain his own thought processes? How much do we know about the basic and rudimentary motives or instincts or impulses uh, which we seek to gratify? Uh, the plant struggling to orient itself in an unhelpful or almost impossible situation struggles to survive. We say it isn't intelligent because it doesn't know why it is struggling. Man is struggling to survive. Does man know why he is struggling? If you had to sit down today and decide in your own consciousness why you are doing what you are doing today in terms of a long-range purpose that is important, well, what would your own conclusions be? Would you have any reason uh, that you could give for your immediate struggle to live a little longer? Why do you want to live a little longer? Is there anything important that you are doing? Is there any important reason for your continuance? You are seeking perhaps to do some common good. Uh, as a nation, we want to live a little longer. Why? What? is the average American citizen's vision of what he can do toward the condition of his country a hundred years from now. Has he any concept of such thinking? Or is he living completely in a series of motions, uh, the substance and essence of which he does not understand very much better than other uh, more primitive forms of life? Man can talk about these things uh, more volubly than any other creature. But having talked, has he said anything? And if he does say anything, does he know what he is saying? These questions affect uh, psychological thinkers and by extension philosophical thinkers. Because as yet there's been no way of successfully uh, differentiating between psychology and philosophy and we sincerely hope they will never find one because without philosophy to, to give it purpose and meaning uh, psychology will never solve the enigma of the human mind with which it is so profoundly concerned. The ancients were not aware of our utilitarian perspective on things uh, but they also had certain essential concepts which they held to be valid. Uh, to ancient man, particularly I'm thinking of the uh, classical Greek culture at the moment, mind uh, was a kind of psychic entity. Mind was a being. Mind was not merely a condition of physical energy. Mind was not a byproduct of function. Mind was a superior kind of creature inhabiting a body. The Greeks represented this in several ways. They conceived at the root of things the existence of a universal mind. And this universal mind they regarded, if not as deity, at least as one of the primary attributes of divinity itself. The universal thinker was the demiurgus, or formator of the world. A universal mind moving from itself 
accomplished all of the works of creation purposefully. These works were according to the mind of God, according to the will of God. There was at the root of all life intellectual purpose. The nature of this purpose might not be immediately available to man. It was not given man that he could read the mind of God, but it was given to divine mind that it could know the workings of the parts of itself. Therefore, while man could not fully understand God, and God, representing the totality of mind, could uh, understand or accept or differentiate, uh, rationalize concerning the infinite diversity of creatures within its own substance or composed of its own nature. Thus, a mind apart from matter uh, but forming a partnership with matter under certain conditions uh, was to a large degree uh, the classical man's approach to the psychological problem. And uh, as we go on today, digging more deeply into mental phenomena, we are becoming more conscious of its profundity less inclined to regard it merely as an incidental part of physical phenomena. Even the modern psychologist of the Western school, who is not particularly given to abstractions, has become amazed and intrigued at the dimensions and proportions of the mental universe. He is discovering, for example, that whereas he thought the physical world was a great and wonderful place with almost infinite opportunity for research and consideration and, uh, unfortunately, for exploitation, he has discovered that the mental world, as it is unfolding to his consciousness today, is infinitely greater than the physical world, that it has infinitely greater potentials that instead of it merely being uh, a fragment of something, it is far more complete, far more all-embracing than the physical life with which he has previously been concerned. It is now dawning upon him more and more uh, that physical existence is the consequence of mind in action. Instead of the mind being a byproduct of irritation and the cerebral nervous system, um, what we call mind, is really the cause of the nervous system, that behind physical matter is this tremendous impulse, a rational, reasonable, conscious impulse, that this impulse projects body, that evolution is not the growth of form, but the growth of mind through form. Uh, that growth is not really merely the expansion of body, but the unfolding or ideation, ideating of energy. That the plant that is unfolding its leaves is bearing witness to flowing energies. That everything that we have previously regarded as purely physical is suspended from a life principle. And psychology has become intrigued with the possibility that this life principle is best understood as mind. Unfortunately, however, we are at another impasse. Uh, we are moving in the right direction, but we are too much inclined to love the idea of finality. Each new discovery we make is ultimate, and we have to uh, reform and revise our thinking periodically. Even though we finally lift the veil of matter and discover mind, we must yet lift the veil of mind, because we certainly have not come uh, to the end of our search for these sovereign realities that are at the root of existence. Mind explains many things, but the more we ex uh, explore mind, the re more we realize we need something else which will explain mind. At the moment, we're not too concerned with this, because we're having too much trouble and too much excitement analyzing mind. But by degrees, we come into the uh, continuous realization that mind can also be sick. And we have uh, a new perspective 
the idea of the mind being responsible for many of the forms of sickness that we have previously assumed originated in the body, and that health is more a psychosomatic problem than we have ever previously realized. If, therefore, we assume that mind can be distorted, can be sick, uh, we come a little bit in the direction of Buddhism. Uh, we come to uh, Buddha's basic affirmation or thought, namely that you cannot trust mind any more than you can trust body as a solution to all mysteries. We really believe that when we understood body, we would understand man. This has not proven to be true. We now finally hope that when we understand mind, we can explain man. This will not be true. When we understood body, we explained body and needed something else. When we understand mind, we will explain mind and need something else. And this has always been the human experience in the search of knowledge. Actually, at the moment, we are already beginning to sense that mentalism as a science, that this science of attributing everything to mental phenomena is beginning to weaken, that it is already showing distinct indications of insufficiency. We are gradually being forced to come back to the old terms that we hoped to discard long ago. We have to begin to think now of the possibility of a spirit or a consciousness behind mind. We have to realize that if mind can be sick, that the health of the mind must be assured by something superior to itself. That if the mind can be caused to depart from law and order, then the mind is not law and order. If the mind is capable of deviation from the reasonable, then the mind and the reason cannot be regarded as identical. If the mind can disobey truth, then m mind is not aware fully of the nature of truth, and truth itself is greater than the mind. We have already come to the rather distressing uh, opinion that with the mind we are not going to discover truth for the reason that it lacks the faculties and the experience uh, uh, breadths and depths by which it can experience totality. And what it cannot experience, it cannot know or define. Thus the mind becomes again a link or a stepping stone to something else. And we have to go further and deeper in our search for the true explanation of things. In the uh, quest, however, for a solution to our mental life, several schools of psychology have come into existence, each with somewhat different attitudes, each with somewhat different findings. And these differences themselves remind us that where difference of opinion can exist, absolute fact is not yet attained. For had we actually the truth, we could no longer be in a state of uncertainty or conflict or opinion. The reason we are in opinion is, the, is that the fact is not actually commonly available to us. The various types of consciousness with which we have gradually come to be concerned uh, may be divided in several ways. We'll use one very simple division now, which will serve the present purposes adequately. We can say we have a conscious mind. That is, a mind that is focused on the level of objective awareness. It is the kind of mind in which there is no mystery. Or at least there is only one mystery and we never worry about it. And that is the mystery of why it's there in the first place. Uh, but uh, the common conscious mind is that with which we can reasonably explain things. It is the mind with which we commonly know things. It is the mind with which we daily live. Uh, there is nothing too mysterious about it. Uh, for instance, we uh, have a certain attitude. 
uh, we wonder why we have the attitude, and the moment we wonder, we realize that we read it in the paper or that a friend told us, and we know how we came to possess this particular opinion. Or we, uh, we can trace the functions of this mind to adequate antecedent causes, and we also can assume with reasonable certainty that its consequences will be consistent with its present directives. Thus, we have no mystery, no great problem. But then there is another part of mind with which we are not nearly uh, so familiar. And that is a mind which seemingly locked within us and below the threshold of our common experience seems to throw constant pressures into our lives. This kind of mind is full of mystery because it causes us to do things we do not understand and often to do things we do not want to do. It contains within itself depths which we cannot easily fathom and frequently results in temperamental personality uh, problems which almost frighten us. It is in this part of thinking that we suddenly realize that we do not know why we do what we do. We do not know the moment in which some further excess, some unexpected, even terrible thing may arise within us. But there is a kind of thinking which we cannot control, which arises spontaneously within us. And that this thinking is, for the most part, uh, somewhat less on a moral and ethical level than our common, common conscious thought, as we are generally aware of it. We have a good many examples of this, and uh, in this particular problem, psychological and psychical things seem to come very close together. We observe uh, what has been psychically referred to as obsession, in which it seems as though another being or another personality takes hold of us, and that we seem to in most instances, find ourselves in servitude uh, to a pressure, a kind of being that is inferior to our normal selves. It is not uncommon to have cases come in of individuals who regard themselves as proper moral persons. Yet under the certain pressures of these obsessional situations, Morality disintegrates. These individuals become crude. They become dissipated, uh, profane. Uh, they become guilty of conduct which outrages their normal and natural attitudes and sensibilities. Yet apparently they have no power to control these pressures that move in upon them. Nearly always it has been observed that where these pressures move in, that they are inferior to the total personality. They represent apparently fragmentation within the personality, in which certain parts only manifest themselves. And these parts are not equal to the total personality from the standpoint of ethical or moral or spiritual levels of achievement. So out of the mystery of it all, and out of thousands of years of observation and reflection relating to myths, legends, symbols, ancient allegories and experiences, the fairy tales, the folklore, all these things, there has come a strong realization that there is within man a kind of subconscious mentation, something that represents a different level from that with which he is commonly acquainted. But this level is very difficult to bring under the control of the conscious mind. And that into this background, as into some filing system, into some uh, deep uh, closet of remembrances, will be stacked away innumerable impulses and instincts which are not commonly drawn upon. But perhaps through the kind of associationalism attributed to the mills, uh, certain present conditions can force the subjective material into objectivity, temporarily at least, 
It is as though the mind had a strange remembrance of attitudes and qualities and uh, draws forth out of its own recesses a ghost like those that haunted the castles of medieval Europe. So man has a ghost world within himself. And this ghost world, which is behind the threshold and below the threshold of his ordinary living and thinking, can involve itself in his conscious affairs very much uh, to his detriment, particularly if he develops strong neurotic or frustrational tendencies. All this we more or less recognize and know, and I've only tried to summarize it briefly, because we, we have another purpose, really, which we're going to get around to presently. And that is to analyze, as much as we can, certain of the procedures that are now in popular use, or in popular usage, to solve these psychological phenomena. For example, we are told today in psychology that one of the most important things is to ventilate, is to bring up this submerged or concealed material and achieve a certain psychological catharsis. That we must get these frustrations out into the open. If we can only move them into the open uh, by preventing them from continuing to build up within the individual, uh, then we can uh, to a very large measure, help to restore his normal. In other words, the great struggle today is towards an extroversional state. Now, this is a charming thought. It's wonderful to live in a world of extroverting people, but it can be a little complicated. And I think the complication arising from our present psychological position and involving much of our educational program and considerable of our industrial and general social concept uh, that this is wrong that we're getting into serious trouble actually the solution to man's problem is not extroversion I cannot see how we're going to solve this by every individual doing everything he feels like doing because most of the things that he feels like doing have not been very good up to now Another point is that most of his frustrations, his neuroses and his difficulties have arisen from doing what he wanted to do, regardless of whether it was wise or not. Uh, mistakes got him into trouble, and the continuation of mistakes will not get him out of trouble. It certainly is not desirable to lock the person into a strong frustrational position in which uh, he will simply continue to be neurotic. What the individual profoundly needs, and what he is not getting, as far as I'm able to observe in any adequate measure, is what might be termed basic psychological education. He needs to know a lot more about himself, and he needs to recognize the importance of governing himself. It isn't catering to himself that is going to restore him. It is learning to become the active director of his own conduct. And this is what, up to now, psychology is not doing. The result is it will take a person with a frustration or a neurosis or a conflict and will perhaps take a year or two, maybe longer, in an effort to uh, work out this problem. Very sincerely, very honestly, try <coughs> to bring the individual into a better adjustment with his own inner life. But, uh, the trouble here is twofold, however. First, the average patient will not stay long enough with the practitioner to get a complete recovery, even from the problem he is at present suffering from. And in the second place, this specialized treatment of a specialty or a situation does not actually equip the individual to cope with other situations totally different which may arise at any moment. The great need is for a solution to the basic problem of the problem, rather than an attempt to solve individual problems by themselves. The individual is much in the position of the man in medical school. He uh, works at first from charts, and he learns where all the structure and organs of the body are located. 
Then he performs his first deception and finds nothing is where he thought it was going to be. Uh, he cannot develop a sufficient theoretical knowledge to enable him to solve all of his problems without certain recourse to essential facts. And in psychology, essential facts are abstract and difficult to test. And it is very essential that the search be made for them with all diligence. When the child, for example, uh, is being brought up under the new psychological <coughs> attitude of being a complete extrovert, the family is no longer able to endure the child. Neither is the neighborhood in which the child lives. The child that is undisciplined is a misery to itself and a misfortune to others. Now we would think the people observing this would then take a greater interest in their adult relationships with discipline. We would begin to suspect that mature persons would say to themselves, the good life is the disciplined life. It is not important that I gratify every impulse and every instinct that I have. Because this program of constant and continuous gratification is habit forming. And when it is continued long enough, it destroys all determination, all inclination, all regard for discipline. Today we are gradually becoming one of the least disciplined people on earth. And as a result of that, our resources in emergency are strongly affected, in this case adversely. If we wish to assume that there is within the individual a subconscious nature which is a bit of a reprobate, or certainly with strong inclinations toward delinquency, which most people must under pressure admit to be the case, then the problem is the re-education of this internal life. How did we make it in the first place? How did we get an interior nature full of frustration and full of negative circumstances? The materialistic psychologist will tell that one of two causes had to be responsible, either heredity or environment. The hereditary factor uh, is open to considerable consideration and discussion. Environment, perhaps, can be regarded as a strongly modifying uh, factor. In fact, some schools are satisfied merely to base their entire case upon the importance of hereditary modification or direction of conduct. All right, let us assume that the adverse influences of childhood, the circumstances of the broken parental home, the failure of intelligent guidance, indifference to child needs, perhaps poor nutrition, perhaps uh, all of the neurotic and psychotic pressures of adults moving in upon the child. All of these things help to make the child sick. Now if we wish to assume all this, we come to a dangerous situation as the child grows up. We have written an elaborate bill by which we have justified this child in being impossible. We have made it obvious to the child that its conduct is not its own fault, that it is a victim of circumstances, that it is rather well headed for disaster in spite of anything it may do. There is, of course, the prevailing possibility that if this child, now grown to adulthood, and being the victim of his ancestors, is willing to further be a victim, but to the tune of several thousand dollars for therapy, he may in time work out of this ancestral complex. It may take him years. He may have gone through many tragedies before he even discovers that such a correction is indicated <coughs> or possible. I am quite convinced that in our philosophical system of thinking, our basic understanding of man, that this procedure is not sound. There are cases where it can be used effectively. But to trust the entire hope of the final mental normalcy of our race upon this concept is not wise. We've got to get into this matter a little further. I think the Chinese have a good deal of information to give us. 
If, for example, a child can be adversely affected by environment and be conditioned by forces moving in upon it, the adult in later life can in various ways affect its own internal life in the normal and proper courses of living. If wrong attitudes have made us sick inside, right attitudes can assist us to correct this sickness. Now, we were not made sick under the supervision of a physician. Our bad attitudes were not carefully calculated for us. We just accumulated them, gratifying our own habits and attitudes and desires. Actually, therefore, the correction is not necessarily a matter for a trained person. The correction is the individual's ability to recognize his own faults and do something about them. He knows more about himself than any other person can know. It will require hundreds of hours of analysis for a good psychologist to find out as much about an individual as he actually knows himself if he is willing to admit it. I've talked to a great many persons in trouble who blame their condition upon ignorance, but when you sit down and study through with them, the average person knows what's wrong with him. He also knows why he's in trouble, and he knows it's his own fault. These things he does not want to admit under normal conditions, but in professional relationships he will frequently admit this. This being an admission which he will make and can make, his remedy and his correction lie within his means. It is a problem of the re-education of the attitudes and practices by means of which he got himself into trouble. This means almost certainly that the individual has to take over the administering of his own life and thought. He says, all right, well, how am I going to do this? It is necessary to have a very elaborate formula for such remedying. I do not think so. The average person is not psychologically sick because of strict adherence to a formula. His psychological difficulties are due to a heterogeneous series of factors which have transformed his inner life into something of a mess. It is therefore perfectly possible for him to gradually reorganize his inner life, straighten it out, by recourse to certain values that are available to him. One thing that he has to recognize is personal responsibility for conduct. It was his own effort that got him into trouble. It is his own effort that got him where he is. And it is his own effort that must result in the remedy or improvement of his state. He gradually worked himself into a disaster. The answer lies that he must gradually work himself out of that disaster. He requires no more than the ordinarily available knowledge of his kind unless he has reached a point in which he is mentally diseased and must come under the general heading of psychiatry. But for psychological difficulties in their various stages of development, the individual can, if he so desires, solve most of them for himself with the instruments and tools generally available to him. Now, there are two important instruments with which he can operate. One is religion and the other is philosophy. Both of these are of great antiquity and both of them were calculated originally in their natural way to meet the very problem with which he is confronted. Man's religious and philosophic life has been autocorrective uh, to his personal neurotic tendency since the beginning of recorded thought. Nearly always you will find the worst oriented individual is the one in whom philosophy and religion are deficient or in which they have been perverted to fanaticism of some kind. A person with a strong, solid, honorable, spiritual, or philosophical conviction is seldom out of his death. It is therefore the general decline of man's spiritual life, particularly his philosophical insight, 
that we can at this time observe the rapid increase of his psychological difficulty. Psychology has become powerful and important in a century in which man's spiritual and philosophical values in the West have constantly and consistently declined. This means that man in neglecting the development of his own internal life has made himself subject to sicknesses of neglect. When he neglected hygiene, he was subject to the plagues. When he uh, neglects mental hygiene, he will be subject to the peculiar plagues that result from this form of neglect. And unless he takes hold of the situation himself, he cannot really achieve a solution. Religion attacks one of the most basic problems of psychology, and that is fear. Fear is present in a great many, an overwhelming number of cases uh, where psychological pressure is present. Fear is man's lack of personal confidence. Fear is the individual's sense of futility, the sense of the magnitude of the circumstances around him and the inadequacy of himself. Fear, philosophically, cannot exist in any nature in which there is a strong statement of values. Fear can only come where faith is weak, and if faith is strengthened, fear is weakened. Thus, in the basis of all of our internal sense of normalcy, we must have this victory of positive faith over negative fear. How shall we achieve this? in our common experience in life. We must achieve it, perhaps, through re-education of values, through reorientation of our own attitudes toward life. Confucius gives us a rather interesting and important guide to the solution of our problem. He points out that the great trouble with most persons is that when they desire education, they choose a subject and master it, thus gaining insight into a subject. Having gained this insight into the subject, they then become distinguished as an exponent of the subject and remain miserably ignorant in everything else. The result is that we have the great uh, philosopher, intellectual philosopher, who simply does not know how to make a living. We have the great artist who cannot get along with his relatives. We have the successful businessman who cannot get along with himself. We have the person who attains to great uh, rational understanding but is never able to control his own temper. All of these eccentricities, these inconsistencies, are the result of the individual attempting to master subjects instead of attempting to master his own relationship to life. Instead of mastering a particular theme, it is first necessary for him to master the principle of learning. The beginning of the secure, normal life of man is the attainment of what Confucius calls the superior state. The superior man, according to Confucius, is simply one in whose life the performance of an inferior action is impossible. It's not a case where he's fought it out with his own conscience and won. It's simply impossible. Because the instinct to inferiority has ceased. And by the instinct of inferiority, we mean the instinct to live below the level of recognized value. How then would you attain to this particular desired state of recognizing value, of becoming the superior person? It must be through the real pleasure of pleasing to do these things.
So Confucius pointed out that the thing to do was to forget the problem of getting better. And in his school, which he ran for a number of years after he retired from public life, Confucius simply forgot all about making people better. Rather, he taught them to enjoy themselves doing good things. He taught them to enjoy writing good poetry. He taught them to enjoy riding horseback well. He gave them opportunity to share in music, in art, in artistry, and in drama. He sat with them and played musical instruments, and they sang together, and they enjoyed it. There was no emphasis whatever upon being better. There was merely the realization that if you were a Chinese gentleman, you enjoyed good poetry. And so, being desirous of being a gentleman, certainly, you enjoyed good poetry. At first, perhaps you knew nothing about it, but gradually, through familiarity, you did learn something. Then you studied the classics. There was no talk about being better. You were simply being exposed to culture. You were being exposed to value. You were gradually developing new standards of taste. These standards of taste, you accepted because they were associated with the people you respected. Uh, you recognized that the great poet and the great scholar in China was an honored individual. He was a superior kind of person. Therefore, there was much inducement to share in the honors and recognition which he received. No discussion of being better simply the process of naturally growing. Not trying to lift some part of your nature, not saying I will control my temper if it kills me, or it probably will kill you. But rather, uh, I will write great poetry, I will love good books, I will walk out in nature and enjoy the sunset, I will enjoy good things and beautiful things, and I will like to be with people who are by nature noble and virtuous and honorable. So by degrees, Confucius, as he explains it, lifts the total nature. He doesn't make one part of the mind stronger than another. He simply lifts all of the consciousness until the individual becomes a little ashamed to do things that are not consistent with his new appreciation his new values. He finds it a little more difficult to be dishonest if he truly loves beauty. He finds it a little more difficult to be unpleasant if he really wishes to be regarded as an admirable person. And by degrees he grows. He overcomes these negative qualities simply by inviting himself to a larger understanding of life. He simply does the things more and more adequately, which he has a desire to do. Uh, Confucius talked to his disciples, or those who came to study with him, and he found that even those of comparatively mediocre personal attainments had certain desires, certain hopes, certain things which they desired mostly to accomplish. One of them wished to be a good horseman, and uh, this was what was emphasized. Because in horsemanship came sportsmanship. And as Confucius pointed out, a man who is a good horseman respects his horse. And a man who respects his horse will respect another man. Gradually also good sportsmanship came in. And the man who believes that the best rider should win the race will also believe that the best thinker should have the office. He will also believe that merits become more important. He will not be envious of those who succeed, but will rather try to fit himself to succeed, because he understands the principle of good sportsmanship. Thus, in various ways, the individual raises his general attitude toward life. 
He raises his attitude by directing his activities toward worthwhile things. Most neurotics have no worthwhile activities. If they have any, they have overworked them or perverted them until they have lost their worthwhileness. The individual who has an activity as a desperate escape from something will never uh, function normally. He will destroy the very remedy which could help him. If, however, having certain restrictions or limitations or problems within his own nature, he seeks a broad, deep compensation through properly selected activity, he will find that by gentle direction he can lead his life into more profitable channels. Thus he can work with the powers and principles that he has. As he goes on, uh, depending more and more upon qualitative value within himself. The philosophy will no longer be a long and difficult word that he is afraid of. He will reach for it and reach for true religion because he has gradually built within himself the kind of consciousness that needs these things. They will no longer be forced upon him as therapy. He will instinctively and inevitably choose them as his own nature under a certain broad directive, is given an opportunity to unfold according to its own laws and principles. Health is the natural state of the body. Normalcy is the natural state of the mind. And this state is most easily restored and most quickly restored by permitting normalcy, by gradually causing the nature to direct itself more and more toward normal expression. A gentle leadership toward normalcy is much better than a violent correction. And the individual will discover that he can, in the most case, in most cases, solve his problem. That his subconscious mind is not going to continue to betray him unless he continues to feed it. If he continues to pour mystery into it, if he is surrounded by circumstances which he regards as dishonest, if he continues to see himself as a victim of this or that, if he lives in a universe which is not rational, and material science takes rationality away from the universe, if he feels himself the pawn of accident or the helpless victim of outrageous providence, if these emotions are within him, he will be sick. He cannot help it. He will regard his condition as hopeless and will dissolve in his own doubts and depressions. Therefore, he has to gradually work through an active philosophy of life. He has to recognize that without rational directives, without convictions that are stronger than circumstances, he can never be truly healthy. A great question has arisen in psychology, and it's being argued all the time, that uh, man may, in his search for some spiritual integrities upon which to build a foundation for life, fall into superstition. That some of the things that he believes may not be ultimately true, that his faith may be wasted on something that is not worthy of his faith. I do not think that this is nearly as important as we make it sound. I don't think the ultimate integrity or validity of a belief is its primary value. We know we live in a relative world, but man is internally incapable of an absolute knowledge of value. Therefore, it is quite possible that what he believes today must be reformed tomorrow. But this does not mean that a belief is not valuable. If a belief is basically beautiful, if it is basically constructive, if it impels the individual to that kind of conduct which restores normalcy and makes him a better citizen, then I think Lord Bacon was correct when he stated that there is no superstition worse than believing that everything is superstition and that it is far better to believe all the fables of the Koran 
and all the mysterious stories of the Talmud than to believe that this universal fabric is without a soul. In other words, we must nearly always believe something. When we believe something bad, we are neurotic. When we believe something good, we are no longer neurotic. We have courage, we have values, we have expression, we have confidence. And in these strengths, we find the possibility of more adequate and more normal personal function. So I believe that the answer to a large number of these questions that uh, psychologists have been working with lies in the reorientation of the total person, educationally, philosophically, scientifically, religiously. And a reorientation in which a new standard of value is made available to the individual. Nothing in the form of our material dilemma can be solved without a better standard of value than we have now. And if we are going to solve world problems, we must use the same instrument that we would use in solving individual problems. We are sick when our standard of value is not strong enough and not high enough. We are well when our standard of value is bigger than ourselves and continually challenges us to grow and to become more than we are at any particular given time. So the ventilation of our subconsciousness can in many ways be affected uh, by a mystical equation. Uh, the ancient peoples had the realization that you could re-indoctrinate this internal part of yourself. The meditative disciplines, uh, the uh, various sacred arts and sciences of ancient peoples and Eastern nations by means of which certain internal life was strengthened. These disciplines certainly were calculated to make a distinct change in the subconscious life of the individual. Self-discipline and spiritual or sacred exercises and uh, rituals also affect this subconscious pattern. They set themselves in it just as excesses and mistakes have set themselves in. They strengthen the internal life, and it is quite possible that there is a wonderful power by means of which man is capable of completely redeeming and regenerating his own internal life. Perhaps this is the alchemistical transmutation of base metals. Man does not have to go on being a neurotic indefinitely. Nor does he have to depend upon a mechanical formula which may or may not actually meet his needs. Neurosis is a challenge. The moment the individual is unhappy, there is something wrong with his mental and emotional life just as surely as the moment he is sick, there is something wrong with his physical habits or his physical economy. Unhappiness is a symptom. It is a symptom of being wrong in something. No one can be miserable and right. No one can be correct and be in trouble all the time. Consequently, we must accept unhappiness or disunity of our inner lives, lack of peace of mind and peace of soul. We must accept these obvious weaknesses as indications of sickness within the psychic life. Perhaps the sickness is not dangerous or deadly, but it is present if we are not at peace with ourselves. Well, again, as we have noted before, this comes into rather violent contact and contrast with our modern thinking. We are uh, more or less taught today that irritation, frustration, neurosis, these things make better people that we must have a big fight on our hands all the time in order to spur us on to what? To the hypothetical achievements of the future. I heard someone not long ago point out that if it was not for this tremendous dissatisfaction, this desperate struggle to be what we are not, 
the whole race would go to pieces. Well, if we struggle much more, we'll go to pieces anyway. We're not going to uh, achieve the end that we want. It depends on what we want. If we want a competitive civilization that is going to go on and on and on, becoming more difficult, more expensive, and more frightening through the ages, until scientifically uh, we involve ourselves in some fantasy more incredible than modern scientific fantasy fiction, if we just want to go on struggling for unknowns and perhaps hazarding our own survival, we can do so. But that we should assume that the continuation of misery is the justification for living is basically wrong. It's based upon the idea we've always been uncomfortable and therefore we might as well get used to it. We have today in the United States more than a million persons mentally sick, but there's no use telling these people to get used to it, nor is there any use in telling them that they are splendid martyrs on the field of progress. There is no use telling them that they may never be well again, but that a thousand years from now we will reach another planet in a steel projectile because of the tremendous kind of stress that wrecked them. This type of thinking is absolutely invalid, and yet it's the kind of thinking that is dominating too many people's minds today. Actually, any form of psychology, any form of sociology, any form of so-called progress, which is essentially detrimental to vast numbers of persons, or detrimental to one sensitive human soul, cannot be right. It is simply that we accept these things because we've never known anything else. Now, we must face some such a situation as this, and we must also, if we believe, as we do believe, in the presence of justice, in the presence of universal good, reality, truth, in the existence of a sovereign purpose and plan behind all things, if we believe in principles that are real and valid, we must sometime recognize the importance of living what we believe. And the moment we start living these principles, because we believe them, we will find that our psychological conditions will rapidly improve. The subconscious of the individual can just as easily be a repository of good as it can be a repository of fear and doubt and anxiety. Now, how can we achieve this in terms of subconscious projection? Again, the Taoists of China have a very interesting concept, and that is the possibility of the visualization of a transcendent state of self. An individual, for example, who develops a bad complex, continues through a period of time to build up a delusion. That delusion, finally taking over the subconscious form of or nature of his being, forms a kind of entity in the psychic field. You can call it a psychic, a psychological obsession, if you wish. It may not be the kind of demon that they talked about in the Middle Ages, but it certainly exercises a demoniacal force upon the person who has permitted himself to build up this psychic parasite in his own nature. If, therefore, a person can build a negative entity which can ultimately destroy him, is it not also possible that the subconscious mind of man has a purpose? That this purpose is not merely to make him suffer. That the subconscious mind of man is also the greatest potential source of growth if he can cause it to retain certain values that are essentially right. Thus, the re-education of the subconscious can be conceived as possible. The Chinese believe that it was done by means of visualization. They believe that it was perfectly possible for the individual to internally visualize himself as he should be, visualize the values and purposes and qualities of his true life. In other words, visualize his true self visualize himself much in the aspect of Emerson's oversoul, visualize himself as a divine being, a 
being living at peace with all things, a being dedicated to the service of good, a being existing and abiding continuously in the presence of the divine love and the divine will. But this being is a sacred and immortal self within man, the transcendent self, the God self. But this God self is also accessible to man. But this God self can be created in the subconscious just as easily as the demon self. Just as surely as the individual may gradually come under the obsession of a tyrannical part of his own subconscious, so he can come also, as the Sufi and the Dervish and other mystics have found out, come into the presence of a magnificent, illumined, internal subjective. But this subconscious life of man is also a magic garden which he fills within himself that he transforms and transmutes his own subconscious by filling it with beauty, understanding, love, and piety, that he gradually also creates within himself an inner life in which he can live, that he builds out of this psychic nature a kind of magic garden like that of the troubadours, that here in the courts of love he can abide in a spiritual communion, his inner life, instead of being a madhouse, becomes a cathedral, a chapel. And as going into himself, he finds there peace instead of confusion. Gradually, this internal self becomes an archetype, a leader. A leader in the direction of positive growth. And the uh, so-called subconscious mind of man then almost becomes a superconscious structure. It becomes the basis of his courage rather than of his fear. It becomes the basis of his growth rather than of his sickness. And the way in which this change is accomplished is through the establishment of the nutritional habits by which the patterns are cast into the subconscious from the conscious. If these things must come out, they must first go in. And that part of our consciousness, which is due to experience, moves from the outside in and then from the inside out again. If, therefore, we move from the outside in, constructive and idealistic value, and that takes up its repository in man, this in turn moves out once more into objectivity as a source of inspiration rather than as a source of fear or doubt or sickness or destruction. It is not, therefore, necessary to assume that this subconscious must always be burdened with difficulty. Now, the problem of the subconscious brings with it another equation, and that is the possibility of the existence of a collective subconscious. Namely, that there is in the universe itself a stratum which corresponds with each of the individualized functions or powers of man. It may, therefore, follow that if there is a conscious mind in man, that this conscious mind is derived from part of the conscious mind of the world. If there is a subconscious mind in man, that this also reflects or reveals in some way the subconscious mind of all nature. And that from this subconscious mind of nature, man uh, receives impressions or impulses from archetypes, or from the great plans and patterns of life. Let us then assume what we have to assume, namely that man's mind, conscious, superconscious, subconscious, unconscious, whatever department we wish to consider, that this mind is not a primary but secondary, and that behind this mind is something else which we might term consciousness, or perhaps more correctly, being. Certainly Buddhism would not permit it to be regarded as consciousness as we know it but rather a state of inevitable and eternal existence. If then there be a source in man, or by means of which man is brought into awareness with natural cause, with archetype, with divine purpose, or the oversoul of nature, as may be implied from archetypal dreams and archetypal experiences of one kind or another, then it would appear, as Dr. Jung points out, that this subconscious mind is like a 
be cool, and that occasionally something will break off at the bottom of the pool and gradually float to the surface, and that the uh, pressures or circumstances or forces, long and deeply hidden, may come up gradually to our awareness from deep sources previously unsuspected. Therefore, we can assume, if we wish to, or at least suspect, that there might be something in the subconscious content of man other than merely the consequences of his own mentation. Assuming that there is a strata that is really a constant circle, vicious or otherwise, of his own mental psychic operations, perhaps there is something else. Perhaps the lower, deeper, and innermost parts of the subconscious are in some way connected with or associated with a still deeper, a more recondite level of natural existence. Perhaps there is a divine will or a divine plan that impresses itself upon the deeper parts of man's consciousness, particularly the subconscious or unconscious parts of the psyche, and by so doing gives man an awareness of spiritual extension or an awareness of cause beyond his normal human, human capacity. We cannot say that this is not true. We can say that there are instances beyond question of doubt in which something superior to the purpose of the individual was impressed upon him through archetypal dreams. We may assume, of course, that this superior thing is a part of his own nature, a higher and a more divine part, which he perhaps never contacts, contacts except uh, through the phenomena of the subconscious or unconscious minds. Perhaps only in archetypal dreams does the will of his own total being become known to him symbolically, emblematically, or figuratively. This is conceivable, but uh, perhaps does not essentially change the, the major pattern with which we are concerned. This pattern has to do with the general perspective which we have toward life itself. Let us assume for a moment that the subconscious or inner part of ourselves, below and behind the threshold of consciousness, as we daily exhibit it, is older, deeper, and in many ways more valid than consciousness. That consciousness is merely a manifestation, a small part of this deeper thing coming to the surface of our awareness. And that for every moment of consciousness, man has a tremendous power of unconsciousness, which is not vacuum, which is not absence, which is not darkness or negation, uh, but a state of a spiritual existence below the threshold of our definition, something that we cannot immediately cognize. If then such is the case, there is every possible reason to suspect that the so-called unconscious or subconscious may have tremendous values. Supposing the great conflict that we have today is due to the fact that man objectively is violating certain principles and laws of his own subconscious. Supposing man as a subconscious being rooted in nature and law, deriving certain inner counsel or inspiration from higher levels of interior recognition. Suppose this conflict is between what man internally knows to be right and the frustration of a program or pattern which he consciously accepts but which subconsciously he cannot accept. Is it possible that our trouble today is that our external life is simply not acceptable to our internal understanding. That we are gradually divorcing ourselves more and more completely from our own internal. That actually, with this procedure which we call living today, this entire total expanse of life with which we are familiar, has nothing in common with the essential purpose of consciousness. We may pretty well assume that this is so. The reason why we may assume that this is so is because we are aware that the motions of consciousness are not identical with the motions of thought, 
And there is no reason to assume that there is a dependency of one upon the other. If man has an existence as a spiritual being, if he has an existence as a unit within the total consciousness of a universal being, if man has any consciousness superior to that of the material sphere in which he exists, then this material sphere and its concerns must be comparatively meaningless to that superior consciousness. The only possible and reasonable relationship between them is that man is here for the purpose of certain experience growth. That the individual exists in the dream only in order that he may be impelled to awaken from that dream. That nothing that relates to an eternal existence can be justified or satisfied by present levels of conduct except the implication of essential growth itself. The only thing that man can really do in this world that is important is become better. The only thing he can do with this world that will help him is to gradually and magnificently outgrow its limitations. By becoming better, we do not necessarily mean egocentrically searching out its own salvation, but through whatever activity, through service, through even martyrdom, through the greatest impersonality and detachment, but by whatever virtue appears to us to be most virtuous, Man fulfills himself in this world only by the fact of becoming a better being. All other values relating to this world are at best indirect attainments. Uh, they, they do not contribute to the principal motion of man. For the last several thousand years, not long ago, well, just a few days ago, I was making quite a survey of the history of the Ottoman Empire and its effect upon the rise of North African and Near Eastern culture. It's quite a book, quite a study. And one of the things that you learn almost from the beginning, and you never have to unlearn anywhere during the procedure, is that you are going to be confronted with an endless pageantry of human selfishness, stupidity, greed, lust, and pillage and you're not disappointed. A, a good sultanate or a good caliphate in that particular period was an island of grace in an ocean of blood. There were only a very few really outstanding benevolent persons. Yet all these persons who lived and suffered and died, who conspired to destroy each other, who aspired to, who aspired to some small gain, who lived by making life unbearable to others. All these have come and gone, and they are the story of man, the story of this tremendous uselessness, this tremendous waste of energy, this constant emphasis upon selfishness in a world in which selfishness can never win anything except a magnificent mausoleum. If man internally knows this, and if he has any consciousness superior to his objective consciousness, he must know it. If man knows this, there in itself is a magnificent reason for a wholesale neurosis. The only answer that can protect man from neurosis under such reasoning is a still deeper reasoning, by means of which he discovers that all of this terrible travesty, this incredible disaster, as our human mind and thought interprets it, is a necessary part of an essential growth. We cannot but remember the thinking and the wonderful words of Vyasa in certain sections of the Mahabharata, uh, where he explains how all of these phantoms of life and death, the phantoms of killing and being killed, are all strange dreams and illusions that out of the entire mystery of life comes the final realization that nothing is lost, nothing dies, nothing actually fails. This, uh, this tremendous internal insight must also lurk somewhere in the rudimentary basic parts of man's consciousness. For without such basic instincts, 
who could scarcely survive the tragic weight of his own errors. Somewhere all of this is locked in man's mind or it could not come out through the voices of the poets, through the great uh, religious revelations, through the magnificent philosophies that have led the world. Men know these things, but they are not able as yet apparently to organize this knowledge into a program of personal conduct. Yet today we are training people, thousands of them, to be counselors, to be psychologists, to take the places of the old counselors that men do. That instead of going to the family minister or the family doctor or the village judge, we now go to the counselor. We go to him primarily to get over a trouble that presently burdens us. But we cannot get over this trouble merely on a mechanical, physical, materialistic formula. This trouble is deeper than this. This trouble goes to the very root of our own consciousness. This trouble goes into the frustration of the individual who is not able to grow and be himself, perhaps does not even know how to grow. So a complete and total reorganization of our educational outlook and our approach toward life, an education based upon an idealistic foundation, is the only adequate solution to our problem. We can never limit man, we can never make him sufficiently physical so that he will forget that behind this physical being there is something else. There is something that is starving and dying for expression and release. And this struggle between our subconscious pressures and our conscious living it may be quite different from what we have generally presumed that it is, or assumed it to be. But this conflict goes into uh, the deepest stratum in which uh, is locked, perhaps, the only real knowledge we have, the knowledge of our own purpose and destiny, which is not consciously available to us, but is unconsciously present as an equation. It is this unconscious equation that makes us forever dissatisfied, makes us forever like the story of the pilgrim in the hymn of the robe of glory, ever seeking something greater, something nobler, and like Odysseus returning from the Trojan War, forever sailing in quest of our own native land from which we have departed. This search for home, this search for spiritual value is always a search within. And this search within now takes us to the threshold of an infirmity. And perhaps this infirmity tells us most clearly what is wrong with us. Because it shows us that we are so living on the outside that the inside of the cup is not clean. It shows us that instead of being able to turn into ourselves as we would enter into a place of worship, we go into ourselves as into a strange sickness and must seek to escape from ourselves constantly in order to escape from this sickness. Man, the noblest creature, with this tremendous potential that he possesses, is actually afraid to search inside of himself. He's afraid to let down uh, the bonds and barriers which he has built, loose the torrents of his own internal dissatisfaction. He is unable to curb or check the measure of the sorrows and pains and pressures that are within him. This should not be. And psychology should be among the first groups to work with this particular equation. Uh, I rather like the thinking from a psychological standpoint on this of some of the early Buddhist doctrines, where I feel that in many respects uh, the Buddhists and Vedantists are very close uh, to the true answer to the entire mystery. Uh, we wonder sometimes why... <coughs> And nearly all uh, religious and philosophical groups of antiquity and even of the modern world have uh, recommended a kind of asceticism. Uh, we wonder why uh, they advocated that their disciples uh, depart from world world worldliness and seek uh, quietude in the deserts or in monastic orders or in convents or places of seclusion. This idea of giving up the world I think what they were striving after was to release uh, the sensory life of man, which is locked so tightly upon objectives. As long as man thinks, lives, and feels in terms only of things around him, he will never escape 
from the vicious fixation in which he is captured. He is going to constantly be the victim of this vicious circle. He will never be able to turn with relaxation to himself. And he will never be able to enter into himself and find there anything uh, that is pleasing to him. While his inner life is loaded only with the reactions of his physical intensity. Most of your great mystical teachings, your Sufis, Dervishes, Druzes, and many other sects, have emphasized that as man relaxed the pressures of externals, he at the same time became capable of living with himself. The moment he was not fighting things on the outside, the spirit of war died in him. The moment he was not under the pressures of jealousy and greed and fear and doubt and worry, when these things ceased, his inner life became immediately more placid. Quietude, quietude then, came from the relaxing away from the intensities of personal attachments and interpretations. In our Western way of life, these intensities are increasing every day. And attachments, of course, can be those of negative fear. I've received a half a dozen letters in the last three months of individuals in a state of complete terror over the possibility of atomic warfare. These people are frightened to death. They are not uh, going to wait to die naturally or supernaturally from the bomb. They're going to kill themselves in the meantime. Uh, they are completely terrified at the possibility of the destruction of themselves by this form of warfare. Yet these same persons are comparatively indifferent to the fact that if there is no bomb at all, they will also destroy themselves. Bomb or no bomb, they're going to be in trouble. Because the fear they have of the bomb is merely a redirection of a fear that they have previously had in everything. Fear will destroy them, not the thing which they fear. And while an individual fears, he is never sure of life, and he is never able to release his own internal into a state of security. It is quite possible that the individual may uh, sometime be faced with great physical crisis. But if he is, all the more reason why he must have his internal resources intact with which to face it. Fear will never accomplish this. Yet persons who do not live well are afraid to die. Yet these persons may be committing suicide with their own thoughts. But because they are thinking the way they want to, this suicide is a perfectly acceptable prospect. All this must change if we are ever going to solve anything. And the way in which it must change is that the individual will either be forced by nature and perhaps through the very instrumentation of something like the atomic bomb or by some other factor. Man will be required by nature to break away from his unhealthy over-addiction to phenomena. He will be shown by nature that he cannot invest his happiness all in external things. He cannot depend for his existence upon success, as he calls it. He cannot be satisfied only by those things which belong to his own external life. As long as he is willing to trust himself to the fate of externals, he will rise and fall with these externals. He will be impoverished every time the stocks go down. He will have a momentary flurry of exaltation every time they go up. But whether they rise or fall, he will ultimately destroy himself. Or he will pass out of this life in polished, because his mind has been on the wrong things. Psychology should teach us to reintegrate around standards of essential value. Should teach us that once we have integrated our inner life, we can then administer any external thing with reasonable security. It is not that man has to give away everything he owns and become a mendicant. It is that the individual must have value within his own nature. And having attained integration 
integrity in himself. He can use all the privileges of living without abusing them. He can solve the problems of material society because he has integrated himself. But without this internal integration, he cannot survive any of the shocks or stresses which naturally come to him. Consequently, it is possible, in fact, very reasonable to assume that man's subconscious mind, which has been plaguing him, is also a plastic substance, which, if it is properly molded, will be the heroic shape of strength within himself. That which is the theodemon is also composed of the same substance as the hero of the world. Man's heroic self can also be internally visualized, built, strengthened by uh, an understanding of the laws governing the power of mind and memory. The subconscious, therefore, can be gradually transformed into the powerful directive which moving out into his external life will put it in order. When the subconscious mind is as strong in virtues as it is now strong in pressures, the individual will live a healthy physical life. Integrities are without pressure. Pressures are without integrity. We cannot have both. As long as we are moved from pressures, there is something wrong. We are moved without knowledge. Education, in the true sense of the word, removes pressure. Any individual who is pressurable is ignorant, regardless of how much he knows in terms of schooling. Pressure is chaos within self. And this means that the person has not integrated his own cosmos. He is not master of his world or master of the sphere of life in which he exists. All these things uh, tell us, as the Zen Shu points out, that man's mind is performing tricks on him. The mind is indeed the possible slayer of the real. The mind is indeed one of the most subtle of all instruments. It is part of the power that still works for good while ever scheming ill, as Mephisto says in Faust. The mind of man a wonderful servant and a horrible master. The individual who gradually gains achievement or victory over the various doubts of his own intellect will find mind a wonderful instrument for the accumulation of experience. But until this mind is honest, until it accepts experience without distortion, instead, in, in, until it records facts without prejudice, until it escapes from bondage to ignorant superstition and fear, until it is honorable in its registering of values, and there's no longer merely catering to the weaknesses and insecurities and immaturities of human nature. Only when it is mature can it serve man. Now, the maturity of the outer mind is not possible. Maturity does not lie in the objective consciousness of man, because this consciousness simply records. This consciousness is now. This consciousness is the kind which gives us the records and evidence of immediate happenings. The present consciousness of man deals with news, as the press tells us. The subconsciousness of man deals with history. And the difference between news and history is rather obvious. All news is gradually becoming history. All history has become news in some time or other. But the important thing is that history is a pattern. It is a consecutive record of news. It is news made moral by reflection. It is news made spiritual by the revelation of the effect of cause and the cause of effect. It is news, therefore, brought into something that can be philosophically examined for the purpose of, it, of contributing to the well-being of the individual now. If Adolf Hitler had really studied history, he would never have permitted himself to be a dictator. It is news that the conscious mind records. In the subconscious, this news becomes history. 
It becomes the basis of philosophy. It becomes the basis of contemplation and reflection. In the subconscious, we have the records of the consequences of things we have done. And we are constantly being plagued by the proof that negative attitudes can only destroy. We have therefore much to learn from it, much to gain from it, if we use it wisely. But if we continue to drift in our old accustomed ways, permitting ourselves whatever excess of thinking may come along at the moment, and then run merely to the mental position in time of emergency, we will be in almost continual emergency. Uh, we have, uh, to a large degree, conquered the ailments of the body. There are a few that still must be conquered, but we are beginning to suspect that those that have not been conquered belong to the sphere of the mind, and that is the reason we have not previously been able to conquer them physically. We believe that many uh, ailments, difficult to diagnose, difficult to prescribe for, are actually psychologically founded within the conscious life of the individual. In any event, we are gradually going to work out diagnosis and therapy on the level of mind. We are going to gradually be able to take care of certain problems of the mind with more efficiency, more understanding, more wisdom than ever before. But just as surely as we do this, we are going to develop a new group of ailments. They are not going to be physical and they're not going to be mental. They're going to relate to something else. They're going to relate primarily to the interval between man's conduct and the universal law in which he exists. There's going to be finally a group of ailments that will be corrected by only one thing, and that is man's voluntary obedience to the divine plan of which he is a part. Also, man's voluntary dedication to self-education until he knows what that plan is. He is going to find that the end of religion is to obey the law. He is going to find that the end of science is to find out how to obey the law completely and efficiently. And that the end of philosophy is to discover the rationale by means of which it becomes evident to all thoughtful persons that obeying the law is the greater good. All of these processes mean that first we must obey the laws of the body to be healthy physically. Then we must obey the laws of the mind to be healthy mentally and psychologically. Then we must obey the laws of the infinite, which is beyond these other factors in order that we may have total adjustment with consciousness. Now, it might seem that these laws of the infinite are a long way off and represent a further state of development far from our present condition. But these three steps are present every day in our lives. Each one of us must obey certain physical laws now in order to remain healthy and obey certain other physical laws, such as those of traffic, if we wish to remain alive. We must also obey certain psychological laws, we must obey those laws which have to deal uh, with certain repressions, certain frustrations, certain inhibitions. If we do not permit ourselves, for example, to get rid of our grudges, get rid of our animosities, and begin to hold some rather kindly, pleasant, and constructive thoughts about things, very rapidly we get so sick we cannot endure ourselves. There are laws here that we have to obey now. There are also spiritual laws which we also have to obey now. And those laws have to do with the great basic motivations of why we do anything. We should not obey physical laws merely in order to stay well, nor should we obey uh, psychological laws merely in order to stay sane. It is our privilege and our magnificent opportunity through our understanding to obey all laws for one value beyond all of this. Namely, that these laws reside in the love and wisdom of God, and that to obey universal law is to prove that we love and respect God, and that we do these things not for fear of punishment, but nor hope of reward, but because it is natural and proper for the human being to worship 
the creator and the great creating power of life in which he exists through the simple obedience to the will of that creator who tells us through his revealed saints and prophets if you love me keep my commandments and this is the basis of health that we are good and are wise and are noble not because we primarily wish to be healthy but because we wish to be right because we wish to worship truly the creating power of life and if out of this power and determination to worship if out of the natural love of God we do all things well then whatever other needs we have psychologically emotionally and physically will naturally move to their own solution if we search first for the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness all other things shall be added unto us and if when from right motive we keep the rules of life we shall then as a byproduct of this right motive enjoy health happiness and peace of soul these are the things we should be learning these are the things our teachers should be telling us because this is the way which not only leads to our own security but to world peace the brotherhood of man and all the good things that need doing